Hey, Internet. Okay, Patrick, tell us a bit more about this Trinity thing. Yeah, Patrick, tell us. How's it going? But remember that we're simple people without your fancy education and books and learning, and we're hearing about all of this for the first time. Mm hmm So try to keep it simple, okay, Patrick? Yeah, real simple, Patrick. Welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. <laughs> Big question today I want to dig right in because it's going to take us a little while to work through this ah, less than clear passage of scripture, but I think it's worth it by the time we're done. Hopefully you feel that way too. Here we go. Pastor Fisk, in Acts chapter 8 verse 17, why had the Samaritans not yet received the gift of the Holy Spirit if they believed in the word of God? Verse 14, and had been baptized? Verse 16, furthermore, how could they have come to faith apart from the Spirit's work within them? All right, this is a fantastic question for a number of reasons, the most important of which is that in the current day mystic modern culture, postmodern culture of our world, the great heresies that are at work among us, I should say the greatest or the most active, the most unseen, are those which are with regard to the person and work of the Holy Spirit. I don't think it means what you think it means. Now that's not to say that there aren't those who call themselves Christians who deny who Jesus is and what he's done in significant ways. It's not to say that Trinity heresy is gone and it's not there anymore but amongst people who go around and are like I'm just a Christian the one that is most absorbed by them without their even thinking about or knowing it but they assume that this false teaching is a true teaching is the heresies regarding the Holy Spirit particularly the heresy of Pentecostalism heterodoxy heresy I'm not saying that they're outside of the faith altogether but they certainly well confess a different Holy Spirit than the scriptures teach <gasps> and we're gonna get into that in just a second with that also what you want to do in this illustrates nice is be careful when you're reading the Bible that you don't import your theology, don't isogete, read your theology into the text. The question itself understands rightly that the person and work of the Holy Spirit is the one who in you creates faith and restores you to relationship with God through the words, yes, and sacraments of Jesus, which are Jesus in the present for you. But just because the Holy Spirit sometimes works in one way or even normally works in one way doesn't mean that he always is bound to work in that way. And so there are times and places in the Bible where God's Spirit does something different and in those times different languages language is often used to describe it. So this is to say that just because the Samaritans had faith in Jesus but had not yet had this pressing falling upon reality which we're going to talk about in a minute happen to them does not mean that they didn't have the Holy Spirit at all. It meant that one particular way in which the Spirit works was not worked yet exactly in their midst. And to know what that is you got to be really careful and attentive to the text because this is a unique passage of scripture. There is not a lot of examples of the scripture using this way of talking. In fact, it's unique to Luke and that I can tell in my short study this afternoon only really happens three times. I mean, there's a fourth mention, but it's in the middle time. So there's three events in which this falling upon the Holy Spirit thing happens. And interestingly enough, in the context of each of these events is baptism and something else, the laying on of hands. Hmm, wonder what that could be. Wonder what it could mean. What you don't want to do is dive headlong into the text as a verse out of context by itself, zeroing in on the one most confusing word in the the entire text because it doesn't have a lot of other connections to scripture falling the holy spirit falling upon epip Hypto, it's the word to fall or stumble, usually a bad word like to fall down or to crash or to have bad things come upon you. But in this case, not bad apparently, but usually that way. What is this word doing here? See, what the Pentecostal error does through its random and regular just kind of pulling verses out of context from the book of Acts that describe a situation and saying, therefore, that's what must happen right now. It's basically the, the normal exegetical movements that are being made by this group. I mean, Acts is sort of the hermeneutical key to the entire Bible. And by Acts, they don't mean the sermon's preached in Acts. They mean the description of things that happened around the sermons preaching in Acts. So you would like zoom in on this one verse and pick that one word that is the least clear word and then just start making stuff up about it. Like therefore what it's describing is that every Christian everywhere has to speak in tongues. Into the truth. He 
and like roll around on the ground and like be like nailed by a burning in the bosom. Who show you things to come. Cosas por venir. Showing Although that you need to go to Luke 4 and the Mormons do that better than the Pentecostals even. <laughs> and you'll know it's all true, you'll just feel it. You'll be a Mormon. And check that one out on your own. So if you really want to know what's going on, you got to take a step back from that and not assume the Pentecostal errors into the text. Because here's the other thing going on right now. These errors are so normal, so common in our world today that when we go to this, we're like, oh, wow. And we start reading what we've heard from others into this rather than letting the surrounding text explain it to us. And so you see the spirit falling upon you. You think, wow, that must mean what the Pentecostals are talking about. You don't even realize you're making that connection. It's just you're just pulling that idea in rather than asking, well, what does the text say that this word word, this very unique word, very unique usage of this word means in its context. Yeah. All right. So before you can even get to this verse, then you got to ask what's going on in the book of Acts. And this is like huge, like watershed stuff going on. I mean, not only have you had the apostles themselves receiving the fruits of the promised Holy Spirit upon them so that they start confessing Jesus before men, even to the point of death and continuing their gifts, which they'd already been given of healing diseases of every kind and so forth. Not only are they baptizing thousands and so the, the the church as community is assembling around their teaching and the prayers, i.e. plural prayers, i.e. liturgy of old, and the breaking of bread, i.e. the Lord's Supper. Hmm? But so much so is this happening that the apostles are having to make more preachers. Yeah? Servants, deacons, they start to call them, who very clearly have the hands laid on to them, which sets this tone, this pace for what's going to be going on. They are set apart as those who are going to handle the food distribution on behalf of the church. And yet we never see them doing that. Instead, what we see them doing is taking up the very thing the apostles themselves were doing, that is preaching Jesus. Turns right around and Stephen is preaching Jesus to the Pharisees and getting himself killed. But you know what? Out of this comes all manner of good things. And then Philip as well, one of the other deacons whose name we know, is led by the Spirit to talk to this Ethiopian eunuch on a road from the book of Isaiah about Jesus, which leads to baptism mm -hmm. with water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For faith, which is going to be different than what we're going to, right? There's another way the Spirit works amongst the Christian community. Everyone gets faith. This other way is a little more unique. But right after this, a little less known, Philip ends up up in Samaria. Ew. Dirty. Bad. Those are the gross people that, like, we don't want to talk to. <laughs> because we're Jews, right? And here, the thrust and movement of the entire book of Acts also needs to be taken into account. The book of Acts centers around two individuals, Peter and Paul. Peter, who preaches to the Jews, and Paul, who goes to the Gentiles. And the whole book moves us from this with this notion, this idea, this gospel, that death and resurrection of Jesus is for both Jew and Gentile. And Paul's kind of primacy by the end of the book, where Peter just kind of falls off the map, is part of showing this reality that the church is not only a Jewish reality, it is in fact a world, racial, nations, everybody, no ethnicities barred reality. Yeah. And if there's any ethnicity that like would have been barred, it would have been these Samaritans because they're, they're Samaritans. They're half breeds. I mean, they're not really human. <laughs> You know, I mean, they are right, but that's the point. So he ends up amongst these Samaritans and he starts to preach Christ. Now notice who is he? He's this guy who has had the hands of the apostles laid on him preaching Jesus. He also then shows that he has this ability, which the apostles had as well, apparently given to him in the laying on of hands, perhaps to cast out unclean spirits. He was doing signs and wonders. He was being, a, you know, apostolic, even like a witch doctor converts at this point. He's just so impressed by what's going on, but he doesn't get it because he thinks it's a about the signs. Common mistake today as well, you know? But when they believed the good news that he was preaching, that is about the death and resurrection of Jesus, his return to judge you innocent for his cross's sake, they were, uh, how does it always end up this way? They were baptized, both men and women, even Simon, who believed it says. And then it's after this that our text happens. So they have been made Christians. The Holy Spirit is active through his word, regenerating unbelievers, even the most unclean, racially unbelievers, so far as Judaism was concerned, into faith in Jesus. Christ. And what happens next? Well, the apostles back in Jerusalem hear about this work that their little missionary Philip, their deacon, their one who has been given the authority to preach and perform wonders, as well as handle the food distribution, <laughs> is having an effect where he is. So what do they do? I mean, what would you need to do next, right? If Philip's going to move on somewhere else, you would need, oh, I don't know, pastors? 
so how are they going to get pastors? Well, Philip could just do it himself, right? He could just assume, I have the ability to make others into pastors and to give them these gifts. You know, like to work wonders. But he doesn't. Instead, he calls the apostles and they come down. And so they come down in order to pray that the Holy Spirit might be sent among them all in this other unique way that is different than purely this word they've already received. That is to say, well, I'm going to interpret here for you ahead of time. Pray that the apostolic ministry might be set among them because Philip's going to move on and they need more preachers. People with the authority to, you know, forgive sins in the name of Jesus. So they come down to pray for them that they, plural, the community, might receive the Holy Spirit. Read it as active through the office of the keys, the office of the ministry. For as of yet he had not fallen upon, been pressed upon, uh, literally, pushed into or pushed down onto any of them. So it's not like they're going to give the office of the ministry to everybody to carry. They're going to place in the midst of them preachers of the word. How? 17. Then they laid their hands on them. This ancient apostolic tradition, which we still cling to as Lutherans, that pastors are made through the laying on of hands. It is not that the laying on of hands is magic, by which God does magic to them. Although initially, certainly, they were receiving the ability to perform signs and wonders through this laying on of hands. But we recognize it as the ecclesial, the church's recognition, connected to the pastors that already exist, and not without the will of the people, but for the sake of the people who are gathering to hear the faithful preaching of Christ, God is sending somebody else right now. That's ordination. Not an act of men, a recognition of an act of God, connected to the apostolic office for the sake of baptizing, preaching, and delivering the sacrament. Now, it seems that when this happens, these same people that are set apart at this point do have some ability to do more than just preach, like, say, perform some miracles. Because Simon, the, the magician, the witch doctor who had converted, he wants to buy... Uh, ordination <laughs> so that he can get the power. Yeah? Now, maybe it's not. Maybe he doesn't actually even see anything. Well, it says that when Simon watches this happen, he wants the ability to go and make more sorcerers. Yeah, because that's what he thinks this is. That leads into the real point of the story. The point of the story at this point is to show that you can't buy grace. Don't happen. No, you can't buy even the sending of apostleship. Don't happen that way. God elects. And interestingly enough, it also does show that one who can believe, as Jesus taught in the parable of the sower, one can spring up in faith, gladly receiving the word, but the weeds, the cares of this life can choke that faith right back out. So Peter then says to this man who was believed and baptized, I see that you're now in the bonds of iniquity. Of course, Simon says, pray for me. Mm, don't really know what happens. Yeah. Okay. So preaching and baptism creates faith in the people. The people need this ministry to continue. The apostles come down to lay their hands on men so that this ministry of the Holy Spirit may be pressed into their community as well. Yeah. Huh. It is a perfectly reasonable way to understand the text if you're not going to already read into the text through the most unclear word in the text what has only been being taught for about the last 150 years or so by a movement that more or less also tends to reject clear teachings of justification by grace through faith and from time to time the Trinity. That's mortalism, Patrick! What? Mortalism, an ancient heresy confessed by teachers such as Noetus and Sibelius, which espouses that God is not three distinct persons, but that he merely reveals himself in three different forms. This heresy was clearly condemned in Canon 1 at the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and those who confess it cannot rightly be considered a part of the Church Catholic. Come on, Patrick! Yeah, get it together, Patrick! You know, you pick and choose, hmm? Now, this does happen two more times in the book. The next time is even more weird and probably more important because it continues to press this reality forward because as bad as the Samaritans were, they still were kind of like half Jews. And this next time is going to happen to all Romans. And it's still Peter, but Peter and the early Jewish Christian church are struggling with, you know, how do we let these Gentiles be? Can they really receive this grace? I mean, don't they at least have to be circumcised? And this is God's big like, no, Peter, I've made them clean. And so he gets called up the house of this man named Cornelius. Long story short, in the midst of, again, preaching Jesus, yeah, preaching his death and resurrection, his return, all the the good stuff we confess in our creed, the Holy Spirit presses himself upon some of those men. And they start to like, you know, speak in tongues and extol God. Now, important, don't read into speak in tongues, ecstatic tongues. It doesn't say that in the text. It says tongue is the same word that was used in the same book in chapter two to describe the languages of men about Jesus. Yeah. So they are confessing suddenly, perhaps even in their own languages, but they're just bursting forth to talk about Jesus. They start preaching Jesus like Apollos did, right? Maybe not with all the clarity of perfect understanding, but they're lifted up to begin to be preachers even in the middle of this burgeoning new community in Cornelius's house. And so Peter's like struck by this, like, holy crud. God ordained these men without even baptizing them. Um, hey guys, I think we should baptize them. <laughs> 
And that's what happens. They baptize them. They baptize everybody and then they remain for some days, no doubt, passing on the fullness of the doctrine of Jesus so that these new preachers and this new church community are able to, well, not go immediately into heresy. Now this happens one more time, not with Peter, but with Paul in Acts chapter 19, where Paul is in Ephesus as a missionary and an apostle. Hmm? So far as they were concerned at this point, one with the authority to send more preachers, but also one who's just out there preaching. And as he passes through, he finds some who are calling themselves Christians, disciples. And he asks them if they've received the Holy Spirit. And they're like, who's the Holy Spirit? And he's like, whoa, um, dude, you guys can't be disciples because you don't know who God is. Yeah. So he says, I mean, how can you not have heard of the Holy Spirit? You say you're Christians. You say you're baptized. Who were you baptized into? Oh, John. Paul's like, uh, no. John baptized with the baptism of repentance, you know, like be a good person because judgment's coming. Yeah. But he was telling them to get ready for the one who was coming after him. And that's this guy named Jesus. Well, on hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus, which means into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, so that now they are in fact hearing about the Holy Spirit, which before they didn't even know he existed. After this happens and he baptizes them into the faith, he also then lays his hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. That is, the Holy Spirit falls upon them. Again, this use of this word epipipto, kind of weird, kind of unique, kind of out of the norm for the biblical narrative, but here Luke uses it specifically, but in connection, not with baptism and not with nothing, but with the laying on of hands, which again, just about anybody in the ancient church would have told you means ordination. And look what happens. He lays his hands on them and some of them begin to speak in tongues of men, of course, about Jesus, because what they're doing as they speak in these tongues of men is prophesying. That is speaking the truth about who Jesus is and what he's done. Paul makes preachers. About 12 men in all, it says, which is interesting because now you've moved from the 12 apostles to the Jews to 12 apostles there in Ephesus amongst the Gentiles at the hands of Paul from Peter. And I mean, it's just like this big movement. It fits with the entire story. Of course, you can reject it because you want to be really hardened in your understanding of Pentecostalism, but just recognize you're reading that into one word too, if you want to count tongues, but you're reading, you're just making that one up too and ignoring everything that's said in 1 Corinthians about what tongues really is and how it's used, that is with interpretation so that everyone can understand that these are tongues of men. The only tongue of angels is Hebrew. I mean, you can look that one up, just a rabbinic phrase. So you can like, can reject this and focus in on that word fallen on them and like insist that it's some sort of miraculous, like special rolling on the ground radicalism, but then you're using one word to interpret everything as opposed to using everything to interpret that one word. Just, you know, kind of not a good move. So I hope this kind of starts to answer your question then as to how did they receive the Holy Spirit? What they received was where the Spirit is going to work more in their community to continue to create what he's already created in them through baptism and preaching, more faith. Where is this at? In this office of the ministry, this office of the keys, which is not the person of a pastor, but the sending of the Holy Spirit via the mouth of a pastor in these words about Jesus. Normally recognized by the church through the laying on of hands saying, go, you are sent, don't stop preaching. Otherwise, well, woe to you. Yeah. So don't hear this as being like, it's about the pastors getting the Holy Spirit. I mean, they're better than everybody. It's just so messed up to set pastor against congregation. That's just not the way it works. The pastor is there to give the congregation the words which carry the spirit. He needs to hear those words too as an individual, as, as a Christian on his own. It's not like he's got some like special dispensation of righteousness out of this thing. It is not about righteousness at all. It's about holiness. It's about being set apart for something, not his own goodness or benefit. He's set apart so that these words, which are the holiness, these words which make all things holy, might be spoken in that place, which couldn't be done if Philip was going to move on in the first place. Couldn't be done amongst Cornelius if the apostles left. Couldn't be done in Ephesus once Paul left as well. So you got to make more preachers. It's just classic mission work. Yeah. Of course, in our arrogance and vanity, we want it all to be about us and it's not. And so we go, no, it has to be about crazy miracles right now. The power of God fell. The glory of God hit. We even started getting oil and diamond dust on our hands. And so we started to anoint the room. We were just calling the glory down. It was so awesome. You go chase that path. I've been down that path. I know plenty of others have been down that path. What you find, generally speaking, is a lot of empty and a lot of vanity in the name of Jesus. I know. And it's just sad. I mean, not that there's no Christians there, but usually they tend to struggle. Good reason. The word gets taken away and you get pointed back to you. Get into that some other time. Hope this helps a little bit. Great question. Or as, uh, thanks for the question, Aaron. I look forward to killing you soon. I look forward to stuff later. Mm -hmm. Take care. Rock on. And who confesses the heresy of partialism? The first season of the cartoon program Voltron, where five robot lion cars merge together to form one giant robot samurai, obviously. <laughs>